Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual meeting and trade show in Washington, D.C. Our coverage here is sponsored by AM General, Elbit Systems of America, General Motors Hydrotech, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS. And we're honored to have with us again Charlie Fries, who is the Executive Director of uh, Global Fuel Cells at General Motors Hydrotech. Sir, thanks very much for uh, uh, taking some time with us at the show. Hi, Vago. Nice um, to see you. Uh, great seeing you again. Uh, we talked to you guys uh, last week as you were uh, uh, doing, uh, you know, as you sort of gave us the kind of the pre-brief on what we should expect. And so this is one of the stars of the show, which is the Cirrus uh, uh, vehicle. You you explained uh, the really the remarkable uh, sort of uh, palindrome um, army uh, uh, acronym, which was important, that actually says something, which I, I don't remember what it said, so I'll, I'll leave that to you in a second. And also, by the way, from a military history standpoint, it was Hannibal war elephant, surviving war elephant, and I don't know how cool it, 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 it gets at that point. So Charlie, tell us um, a little bit, you know, walk us around, uh, first tell us what Cirrus stands for, and then give us a walk around on the vehicle on the features uh, that you have here, because your idea was to do a fully autonomous seven, uh, 17 foot long superstructure that's infinitely uh, adaptable, fuel cell powered, 7,000 pounds of cargo. Talk to us a little bit about uh, this incredible vehicle we're seeing. Sure, well, Cirrus stands for Silent Utility Rover Universal Superstructure. So that's, that check, we got a, We got an acronym for the Army, right? That's, that's an important part of it. But the other side of that is, it's a palindrome. So a palindrome means it's the same forward and backward. And that's important because as you can see with this vehicle, there's no obvious front or back. It's, it's capable of moving in either direction. And we've done that with a chassis that's built on technology out of our truck, our heavy duty truck chassis. And then we built four wheel steer and four wheel drive off of it with electric drive motors on both ax, uh, sets of axles. So with this, you can see here, this is where the hydrogen refueling goes in. So we, we've got over about nine and a half kilograms of hydrogen on board and then a battery system below that. And then you can fuel it here, and in minutes you can fuel up and get your 400 to 600 miles of range. So that's that's one of the advantages that comes out of it. The superstructure, as you can see it here, it's got it has flexible mounting points all around it. So the idea of this vehicle that we talked about last week, now now here it is. But the the, the point on this is that this vehicle is something that we can put either big big cargo containers, we can haul extra fuel, you can put a, an ambulance on the back of this, um, some sort of a medevac system, which can be autonomously controlled. So it doesn't need necessarily a driver on board. And you can start to think of this as something that it's got many commercial applications, and then those same commercial applications have also a military application as well. And so we can now think about configuring it in the field. I don't need to have a separate vehicle for each one of these purposes, and it exports about 100 kilowatts of, of power, electric power. We'll see that on the other side. And um, what are some of the technologies you guys are using that straight out of GM? You guys uh, have been, you know, and, and full disclosure for those who didn't notice, you're one of our sponsors, so we appreciate that very much. But talk to us what you're drawing from all of the automotive, uh, autonomous vehicle technology that's being worked on on the commercial side of the business that you guys have adapted to this to give it that sort of, not just the mobility, because I have a couple of suspension questions, although I know, I'm not sure if I'll get anywhere on them. Uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the things, you know, this stuff is stuff you guys have been developing, but talk to us about some of the other stuff that you're actually drawing straight from what General Motors has been working on. Yeah, so one thing G GM does is we build a lot of trucks, and those trucks have very, very capable chassis. So we've taken parts right out of the parts bin for that. So this chassis is, is part of our heavy duty chassis portfolio, and then we built on that the suspension system, which you're right, I'm not going to tell you all the details about the suspension system, but what I will tell you is we built on the things that we've learned off of vehicles like the, the Chevrolet Colorado ZR2, which is a production vehicle, and the Chevrolet Colorado ZH2, which you can see in back of us here, which is the fuel cell version that has been testing for the last 12 months, and it has proven itself to be extremely effective off-road. It has the same 37-inch tires as you can see here. So we've taken those parts, we've reapplied them here with improvements. Um, we've also taken uh, the, the hydrogen fuel cell system that we're taking into our commercial program, so that'll be something we will be producing in the 2020 timeframe, and that's uh, uh, 
actually a shared system that will also be used by Honda. So that same system allows us to get scale and we can also take advantage of sharing the development costs and getting more cycles of learning. So General Motors has been talking recently, uh, the last few weeks, about how we've got the zero, zero, zero strategy. So that's getting to zero emissions, uh, zero congestion, and zero accidents. And so in part of that, we have not just electrification, which is part of the BEV and fuel cell strategies for electrification, but it's also getting the autonomous capability in place. So we're building on that autonomous capability with this vehicle as well, reusing sensors out of the sensor suite and the strategies that we're developing right now with on-road autonomous technology. You can even think of things like the Cadillac Super Cruise as one of the steps along the way for a leader follower type technology that can apply to vehicles like this. Well, let's take a walk around on the uh, other side of the vehicle and you have um, a sensor here, right? You have one on each side and then one on each corner. Uh, tell us what, what these do and everything does in conjunction. Yeah, these are actually stereo cameras here. Um, we have uh, uh, radar systems along the bottom on the sides. And then if we come around here, you can see um, now these are LIDAR systems right here. And you can see we've got cameras also on the front and other radar technology built into the bumper system. So again, we're using technology out of our other autonomous programs. If we move around to the back, This is kind of the operational uh, location for the vehicle. So if you, if you take a peek down under here, this is where the fuel cell system is located, along with the hydrogen storage tanks and power electronics. You can't see the, the uh, motors because they're kind of up in front on each of the uh, axle areas, but it gives you kind of an idea where the power is generated. But then we have another portion of the, of the uh, chassis here where we can export that power. So that turns this whole vehicle into a roving uh, generator, a roving power generator. We can export power up to about 100 kilowatts and make that either available for whatever the cargo is on back of the vehicle or for offboard as well. And uh, you guys also have uh, the potable water generator uh, system here as well, right? Because the byproduct of the fuel cell is water. Right, yeah, we don't, we don't have any other emissions other than water vapor, and so if you collect the water vapor, it's deionized water, so you have to do something to actually make it drinkable by humans, otherwise you get sick. But um, it, is a, it is a potable water source, and that's one of the big challenges in the, in the field, is not just hauling the logistics chain for the fuel, but also water, so we can help both of those problems with a vehicle like this. So let me ask you um, sort of one of the $10,000 or $60,000 questions that's, that are being asked at the show, and one of which is, um, almost every single automaker, uh, vehicle maker here is saying, man, I wish we could buy this from Charlie. So how long before you know, any of the CEOs of the other companies, uh, whether it's the folks at AM, AM General, whether it's the folks at BAE Systems or Oshkosh or anywhere else, can buy, you know, that you can start to commercially sell them this fuel cell technology because whether it's for heavy vehicles or lighter vehicles, there is a demand for it and folks want to get their hands on it to at least prototype and to, to test it. How long under the GM strategy will it be before you know, Andy Hove can come over and write a check and, and buy an X number of fuel cells that he wants to put in, for example, his next generation of Humvee? So we're already testing with some companies out there where they have some prototypes that they're evaluating. And so we're going through the development, the execution process right now. We'll start the manufacturing plant, which will, which will be in Brownstown, Michigan. That'll be out in this 2020 window. So leading up to that, there'll be stages where we can go through prototype development and integrate into different applications, let the customer get some exposure to the technology and understand how it fits into their application. We can understand their application also, so we understand if there's any special need for the application itself and how much re reuse we can get, and then build that into the plan. So if there's anybody interested in the technology, they should come see me. <laughs> um, let me ask you about uh, GM Defense. Uh, when I asked you that question early last week, there was no answer, but on Friday apparently there was uh, an announcement. Talk to us a little bit about what GM Defense means. What are the components that are going to be in that business? Legendary name from the past that went away during the merger and acquisition, uh, uh, a wave that, that we saw um, at the end of the Cold War. Talk to us a little bit about um, what this new business is going to do, how it's going to be positioned in the market. Well, it was, an, it was, a, it was an amazing question that you asked last week, which I wasn't prepared to answer at that time. So um, now we can tell you, we, we have actually come out with um, the public information that we are restarting kind of a, a, a defense type initiative that, that, that will be under the name GM Defense. Um, that this is something that uh, GM used to have uh, historically, but now we're, we're uh, setting it up under the, the new GM company that we're under today. And and what it will allow us to do is take the technology that we're already developing in 
our commercial applications, continue to develop that so we can keep the cost down, we can be faster to market, we can get as much reuse and scale as possible. But at that last, you know, the last mile where you've got to go in and you've got to do something that's different, this gives us a, a, a mechanism to go and do that and better support customers in the federal government where they might need to do something that's outside of the commercial space and they need something that's more adapted for a specific military application. This, this sets us up to better support that. And, uh, and you see yourself getting into the vehicle game, uh, light vehicle game, medium vehicle game. I mean, you guys, you know, through your history, have built it all from the lightest vehicles all the way up to the heaviest tanks. Do you guys see it playing a role in, in sort of not just um, interesting technologies and autonomous systems like this, but actually classical vehicle market as well? I think we can look at a range of applications. So it's something that we're not we're not really bounding it. It could be with basic technologies like propulsion system technologies. It could be integrating something into a vehicle like this, and it could be the complete vehicle, or it could be beyond that. So we're we're not really limited. Um, let me ask you about um, the Colorado you guys have over there. I love the bent license plate, by the way. Did, didn't you say at the briefing that that was the only? Um, license plate on an army vehicle or something like that, or you had some other interesting statistic. Yeah, I think that's the only vanity plate in the federal government. Uh, yeah, H2 Power, and um, they, they took it through some, some rough territory and they were able to bend the Bend the plate. Um, I, 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 and, and, and if not, your, um, uh, your, uh, you know, theatrics department did, did a great job on it. But talk to us a little bit about the difference. I mean, that is a Gen Zero vehicle. Yes. That's the vehicle that was here last year before you turned it over to the Army to to use. That's now been to four bases. How many bases has that been to? And what what I'd like you to talk about is. Okay, what are the capabilities of that vehicle, and what are the capabilities of the fuel cell that's sitting on the other side of it that is a derivative of this built with the experience that you've gained from that? Yeah, so so the last year when we were here at AUSA, the ZH2 was not really in full operational form, and we, what we promised is that we'd bring it back in about 12 months operational with data, and that's what we're here to do. So it's been around, it's all, been around bases all around the United States, it's been at some military proving grounds, it's been at our proving grounds. We've been doing a lot of work on the technology and trying to kind of show what it's capable of, and we've got that exposure now. Uh, so that system is actually using our generation zero fuel cell system. That was something from actually back in the 2007 time frame, we'd had similar systems that were in Chevrolet Equinox vehicles. Uh, but that, that technology, we're actually two generations beyond that now. And so we've, we've taken the size down dramatically. It's much less than half the size and less than half the mass. The cost has come down dramatically. That system actually had about 80 grams of platinum to make the, the electric, uh, um, the, electro, or the chemical reaction that's uh, an electrochemical catalytic reaction that's within the cell itself. We actually do that with a, a platinum-based uh, catalyst. And now we've been able to take that down to about 12 grams. So that takes a lot of the cost out of the fuel cell system, which is a, a big advantage to us as, as we go forward. We've taken the size down by going to things like instead of having a, um, a bipolar plate, which is made out of a composite and it's very thick. We've gone down to these stamp metal plates which are very thin, using technology that's not too much different than what you'd have on a head gasket. So that takes the cost down, makes it more durable, uh, improves our ability to seal around the system and get to a very compact, dense system. Those are just a few examples. Are, are you confident that the cost of a fuel cell engine is going to be something that's going to be very comparable to that of a standard internal combustion engine? So that ultimately from a, from a sales perspective, it's going to be a one-for-one one kind of trade-off that, you know, if someone wants an internal combustion engine, you'll sell them that, but if they want a hydrogen fuel cell, they're going to get that, or is there always going to be a premium on the technology, do you think? Well, right now, internal combustion engines are built in the millions. Uh, you know, here we're talking about very, very low volume, relatively speaking. Um, we've also been through over 50 learning cycles on internal combustion engines to take the cost out. We're only in our second learning cycle, really, uh, past the Gen Zero here on the, on the fuel cell system. So we've got a long way to go before we can actually get to the level of cost reduction and, and, and the refinement that exists after over 100 years of internal combustion engines. But the pathway shows a lot of promise. And so we can do things also with the system that aren't possible on an internal combustion engine. And even some of the costs on the internal combustion engine go up as you start trying to emissionize them for, for more stringent, stringent emission standards. And as you have to calibrate that system to many different vehicles, whereas a, an electrical drive system, you get some advantages that it's a little bit easier to adapt it to a range of different vehicles. Um, two last questions. Um, what is, um, 
you know, the, the fuel cell is most efficient when it's running at a constant level. That's one of the reasons you have batteries in these systems for peak load so that, for example, when you're hill climbing, uh, you're, you have some place to put the regenerative effort that you reclaim from braking, but the battery also kicks in to give you that boost, to give you that extra power to go over, for example, a hill or something like that. Um, but they like to operate sort of at a constant load, constant basis. What are some of the challenges, you know, given that each one of these military vehicles, it's start, stop, start, stop cycles, which fuel cells are not crazy about, or at least the fuel cells we've had to date aren't. What are some of the challenges associated with that, and what are some of the things you guys are doing, because I know you've been thinking about this challenge. What are some of the things you're doing so you're not uh, you, that, that you're not sort of prematurely shortening the life of something which has an extraordinary, it's 180,000 miles or something that comes out of a fuel cell set, which is, which is a pretty extraordinary statistic. Um, talk to us about, about that element of it and what you guys are doing to, again, part of the operationalizing uh, 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 process. So batteries are extremely efficient. Um, a battery, a battery propulsion system can be about 93% efficient, and so that's that's advantageous. And it also provides the ability to provide a lot of peak power. But you're challenged in terms of mass and and the, the packaging volume, as well as the recharge time when you try to put a lot of energy for a long endurance mission on board that vehicle. And as you get to bigger and heavier vehicles, you're more and more challenged with the batteries. That's where the fuel cell can come in because hydrogen gives us the ability to store electrons from a mass and a volumetric standpoint, we can put a lot of electrons on board the vehicle with hydrogen, and that, that's a very nice complement for the battery system, so you can start to blend the two technologies, so you can get some of that peaking capability out of a battery if you really want a lot of peak power, but you can get that range extension with the fuel cell and the fast refueling of minutes, not hours and days. So all of those things fit really nicely together when you start talking about the two together. Now, we've been developing fuel cells for years now, and, and we've been working through the technical challenges, and there used to be many. Um, actually, I think the very first fuel cell vehicle GM put together, you actually had to turn it only in one direction, otherwise the water sloshed to the other side and it would foul out the stack. Uh, we've, we've, we've really dealt with those problems long, long ago and worked through that. So you can see with a vehicle like the ZH2, it goes off-road, it does what it needs to do. That vehicle's been running in altitude, hot, cold operation. It's done all of those things and, and we're able to manage that. But you do have to do a lot of smart things inside the stack with how you manage water because obviously water is the byproduct of the fuel cell system with the electrochemical reaction that happens. When we make the water, if you leave it in the stack, just like anything, you take it below freezing, and if it's not running, you can freeze the water. When the water freezes, it expands. So you have to deal with that. You do it with a lot of materials. Um, we, we have hydrophilic and hydrophobic materials at the right places in the, in the system. We've got ways that we deal with where water can collect or pool, and then we have ways to flush water through the system at the right point in, in the operating cycle. So all of those things can be managed as long as you have an intelligent system that you know how to, how to manage the physics of the problems and you can deal with that. Well, that's a little bit like containing thousands of explosions under the hood of your car every second. <laughs> different that, problem. Different problem, different but, problem. But, but still yeah. presents its own challenges and, and a wonder that the thing doesn't burn up, which is a reminder to everybody to check your oil and tire pressure. Um, last question, what's next for Cirrus, right? So you guys have developed this, it's the bell of the ball, you've rolled it out. Now talk to us about what's next as you you know, are you going to be building 15 or 20 of them and handing them over to the United States Army so that they can play with them? So the next step is we've got the fuel cell system. It's, it's in its development as well as all of the different subsystems that are on this vehicle. So the next step is to continue to integrate and optimize the system like we did on the ZH2, get through that operational uh, stage where you've got to go in and calibrate it and start to prove it. And then working with our partners in the U.S. Army, TARDEC, we've got to decide what the right mission is to go out and apply the technology and see how we can get it, you know, prove its chops out on the field. So that's kind of the next thing that comes up. Charlie, thanks very much for all the time. Thank you. Really extraordinary. Best of luck with the program, and thanks very much for the support. Thanks a lot.